So back to waves and particles. Um, Louis de Broglie, in, um, he, he only died in 1987. Um, he proposed way back in 1924 that particles could have wave-like character in addition to their particle character. Um, and the electron does this. It acts like a wave and it acts like a particle. So we most clearly see its wave nature in electron diffraction. And so we can get diffraction patterns from electrons going through a slit. What's very, very bizarre is that the interference pattern is not caused by pair pairs of electrons interfering with each other, but single electrons interfering with themselves. I know, right? So if we have an electron source and we're sending electrons at a barrier that has two slits, we observe an interference pattern, just like we see with visible light. And, and this is happening by one electron acting as a wave, the wave going through the slits and interfering with itself. If the electrons behaved only like particles, then we should just see two bands of, of signal on our detector. Because when particles go through, they're going to go through one slit or the other, keep going in a straight line, and hit the sensor. Does that make sense? So. Electrons behave like waves, and that wave nature is an inherent property of individual electrons. So an individual electron is a particle, but it is also a wave. And so de Broglie pre predicted that the wavelength of a particle was inversely proportional to its velocity. So this is what's known as the Bro de Broglie relation. Here we have the wavelength of the particle is equal to Planck's constant divided by the mass times the velocity. That's the velocity, not the frequency. I know, you can't tell, right? There's Planck's constant again. So we can do calculations with this. What's the velocity of an electron that has a de Broglie wavelength approximately the length of a chemical bond? which is about 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. So the wavelength is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. Our de Broglie wavelength uh, relation said that the wavelength um, was equal to h divided by the mass times the velocity. And let's go back and check that. Yeah. So if we want to know the velocity, we need to rearrange this equation. Now I've showed some of you this. I'm going to show it again. Um, when we're rearranging equations, you can cross multiply, but you can also do this. So if I draw a line, um, this would be the line where the fraction line would be and a vertical line where the equal sign is. I can rearrange this equation. I can take anything from this quadrant and move it to this one. You can move diagonally across here or diagonally across there. So I can take this lambda and move it down here. And I can take this V and move it up here. You accomplish the same thing by cross multiplying and then dividing by the things you don't need. This is just a heck of a lot faster. So we get the velocity is equal to Planck's constant divided by the mass times the wavelength. So we need Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. 
joule seconds. Um, we need the mass of an electron. Hey Siri, what's the mass of an electron? The electron is a subatomic particle, symboly, or Greek letter beta, whose electric charge is negative one elementary charge. Want to hear more? Yes, what's the mass? Electrons belong to the first generation of the lepton particle family and are generally thought to be elementary particles. That's just really not useful. You let me down, Siri. I'm really disappointed. 9.111 times 10 to the... 10 to the negative 31? Thank you. Oh, Siri. 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Usually she just flat out tells me, but not today. I don't expect you to know that number. I, I don't remember. I could kind of guess at it, but I don't remember it. Um, and then we need the wavelength. So down here, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. So we can do the math. 6.626 and e minus 34 divided by 9.11 ee minus 31 divided by 1.2 ee minus 10. We're getting 6.06 .06 times 10 to the 6. Probably round to 6.1 times 10 to the sixth. Um, what about those units? We've got joules times seconds and kilograms times meters. And what would we like to have? like meters per second, right? A joule is a newton meter, which is a kilogram meter per second squared times meter. That's a newton meter, and then we've got times a second, and that's divided by kilograms times meters. Um, this second cancels that one kilograms cancel, meters cancel. This does work out to units of meters per second. If you don't understand that, you're okay. I won't try to trick you with units on a problem like that. That's mean. You may think I'm mean, but actually I'm not. I'll save that for my kids. So the uncertainty principle, um, when you try to observe the wave nature of an electron, you can't observe its particle nature. If you observe its particle nature, you can't observe its wave nature. You can't see both of them at once. The wave nature we can observe as the interference pattern in a double slit. Uh, the particle nature would be the position of the electron. Which slit is it passing through? Because if it's a particle, it has to be going through one slit or the other. It can't go through both at the same time. And yet, as a wave, it does go through both, both at the same time. So these are called complementary properties. The more you know about one, the less you know about the other. So if we have that double slit experiment set up with the electrons and they're giving us a nice interference pattern not pictured here and we take a laser beam and shine it through here so that we can detect which slit the particle goes through the diffraction pattern goes away and we see two bright spots now the electrons are behaving like particles you take the laser beam away they act like waves again, right? 
How does it know that we're looking at it? I don't know. It's, it's a mystery. So Heisenberg's uncertainty principle kind of quantifies this, and, and we're not going to really use this equation for anything, but the idea is the more accurately you know the position of an electron, the less you know about its speed and vice versa. So we cannot know where an electron is and how fast it's moving. We can know one or the other, but not both. So what this says is that the uncertainty in the position times the mass and the uncertainty in the velocity is larger than or equal to this value, which is Planck's constant over 4 pi. We can't simultaneously measure one, measure both of them. We can measure one or the other, or we can kind of know one and know less about the other. It's frustrating. So classical physics says that particles move in a path that's determined by their velocity, their position, and the forces acting on the particle. And this is what makes sense to us. This is called determinacy. The present determines the future. Because we can't know the position and the velocity of an electron at the same time, we cannot predict what path it will follow. Indeterminacy. The, the future can only be described statistically. We can't predict predict it based on present situation. So the best we can do is describe the probability that an electron will be found in a particular area using statistical functions. Here's the classical concept of trajectory. We got a baseball player here. It's convenient, it's baseball season. Um, Pitcher pitches the ball, batter hits the ball, he exerts a force on it, and it flies through the air. There's wind resistance involved, maybe some effects from the spin of the ball. You've got gravity pulling down on it, um, the force with which it was hit. And all of this can be mapped out and quantified and understood. From the position of the ball, the outfielder can predict where it's going to go. Our brains do a lot of calculating that we are not even aware of. Because how does that outfielder know where to go? His brain has learned when it's moving this fast in that direction, he can predict where it's going to go. And he can get under it and catch the ball. It's amazing when you stop and think about it. We can calculate it all with physics and stuff too, and then it becomes really, really complicated. Electrons don't act like that though. If you're pitching a ball, a good pitcher can pitch that fast ball same way every time. He can control, is it gonna be high or low, inside, outside, and when he throws a ball as opposed to a strike, He's doing it on purpose, not just because he's screwed up. So he throws the ball the same way every time the ball goes to the same place. That's classical physics. If we did that with electrons that are ultimately small, they would not go to the same place every time. Even if you threw them in exactly the same way, they would not go to the same place. I find that very disturbing. This just shouldn't happen. And it's not possible with large objects like baseballs. But the ultimately small do not obey the same laws. So if you pitched an electron multiple times in exactly the same way, you would see that a lot of times it's towards the center of this area, but it can also be out here and it could <laughs> hit that lady in the face, right? I mean, it could just like go off really randomly, but you can look at a percentage or statistics of, well, 90% of the time it's gonna fall within this region or 10% of the time it's gonna fall within this region. And that's the best we can do. So you can look at the number of pitches versus the distance from the center of the strike zone and you see that there's a relationship here 
Um, it's more likely to be towards the center of the strike zone, but it can be out here as well.